Good afternoon. I, I think the world is filled with magic. Just think about it. The moment we come into the world, the minute we start talking, every day we ask 100 interesting questions. How do birds fly? Why do birds fly? How are babies made? Then we grow up. And I think as we grow up, we have different ways to deal with magic. Some of us no longer see it. Others, I think, make a mission from recognizing and celebrating it. I do not belong to these categories. I think that magic is something that is just not yet explained. When, I think if you want to be happy, you need to figure essentially two things out. First of all, you need to find a source of magic that makes you tingle, that you're passionate about. And then you do something about it. I discovered my source of magic early on um, by accident as I was browsing some old uh, journals in the library of the Technical University in Cluj. And I came across a paper that was written by Bill Woods that talked about how you can maybe write some questions in English and have those questions understood by the machine and get the answers back. And when I read that article, I said, wow, this is it. This is magic for me. This is what I'm going to do with my life. I'm going to spend my whole life doing stuff at the boundary between humans, language, and machines. Now, of course, that's a little bit too um, well, ill-defined, if you want. So it took me a little bit of time until I was able to uh, get to a much better defined question. So as a PhD student at the University of Toronto, what I figured out, for example, is that there are some good texts and bad texts, and that it's enough to take some good text and just shuffle a little bit the sentences, and very soon you get something that is incoherent. And at that time, there were no mathematical theories, no computer programs to help you figure out which text is coherent and which text is not. So um, I set out to write a mathematical formalization for this, and eventually computer programs uh, that could understand text, and it turned out that, let's say, the first text is coherent because it has some internal structure. So, for example, you may uh, give an idea first that Mars experiences frigid weather conditions, and then you give more information, you elaborate on it, and you make some contrast, and so on and so forth. So, the, it turns out that if you can discover the structure of text, as a side effect, you can also build summaries. So, since the second part elaborates on the first one, maybe you can say the first one is more important. By the time I got to this point, I said to myself, wow, this, this is pretty interesting. What we can do, maybe we can commercialize the idea. Maybe we can build a summarization system. So, I went to my very good friend, uh, at the University of Southern California, Kevin Knight, and we started thinking how we may commercialize uh, the summarizer. Now, it turns out it was an idea that was only about 15 years ahead of its time. So at that time, uh, uh, mobile platforms, the web, um, did not require the compression of information at the level uh, it is required today. So. We had the perfect product, the perfect technology, but there was no market for it. Now, by accident, I started to talk at a conference with another good colleague, Jill Bernstein, who at that time was working for the Educational Testing Services. Turns out that in the United States, and not only, students every year, they take exams. They are asked to write uh, essays on a very broad range of topics. And uh, at that time, the way educational testing services was assessing the quality of these uh, assays was by employing essentially two humans. So two teachers would typically read an essay written by a student, and if their score was bigger than, the difference between their assessment was larger than, let's say, one point, then they would bring a third human into the loop. And eventually, the final score that the student got was determined by averaging among the humans. Um, by talking to Jill and by taking the technology that understood the structure of the text 
and many, many other types of uh, indicators of tax quality, we eventually managed to build a system that replaced one of the humans. So the machine essentially got to make or to agree with uh, another human at the same level as two initial judges. So uh, ETS eventually transitioned the technology into production and moved from uh, an assay being evaluated by two humans to an assay being evaluated by a human and a machine. Later on, um, ETS also has introduced the technology into an online framework where students can go and can type in assays and can essentially get immediate feedback from the machines and learn how to write, how to improve their writing on a daily basis. And uh, I'm expecting now that in just a few years, my kids are also going to play with this system. So in some sense, in 15 years, we went from something that looked completely magic. Nobody believed at that time that computers can assess the quality of a piece of writing to just in 2013, now on this platform, more than 12 million students writing essays and having those essays scored automatically. My second encounter with magic was in the world of machine translation. So, if you ask even today people, is it possible to translate text? I think you get two types of answers. So, at one end, you have the people who say, no, 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 that, that will never happen. How could a machine translate between, let's say, Romanian and English? At the other end, you have the people who say, come on, that's already done. Haven't you gone to Google Translate? I mean, it's there. It's already working. I think the, the truth is, is somewhere in the middle. But 15 years ago, the way machine translations were built was by essentially asking linguists to write lots and lots of rules. And it uh, turns out that's pretty complicated and rules conflict with one another, and they're ambiguous, and grammar is ambiguous, and everything is extremely difficult. And at that time, uh, there were just a few machine translation systems for a handful of languages that had sufficient commercial value to justify keeping, let's say, a large team of linguists uh, locked in a room for 10 years writing down these rules. Now, that world was a little bit changed conceptually by a group of researcher at, uh, researchers at IBM that was led by Bob Mercer. So what that team asked themselves very early at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, they asked themselves, is it possible maybe to build machine translation systems without any sort of linguist in the loop? After all, we as humans leave behind us a long trail of texts, the translations that we write ourselves. So maybe we can have machines examine these texts and come up with translations automatically. Now, that was an idea that was also too early for the 1990s. So Bob Mercer and his entire team left the IBM research group to join a startup, a hedge fund, and to apply exactly the same techniques that they were applying to try to do machine translation in the 1990s to predicting the stock market. And today, they're all billionaires. So, as a consequence, after that group left the field, the entire field died. So, there was no one in the world who had any clue um, how statistical machine translation, if you want, worked. So, this time it was my colleague, Kevin, who came to me and said, well, let's, let's take a look at that. Maybe there is something interesting in this idea. So maybe we can apply some uh, interesting technology so that we can learn how to build a machine translation system automatically. And um, little by little, we understood what uh, the people did in the 1990s. And then we moved on to writing our own mathematical equations describing how you can map from one language to the other. And before we knew it, we started extracting from text lots of knowledge so that, for example, if you looked at the sentence in Chinese, then you had maybe lots of ways in which you could translate that sentence. And for every single word and phrase in that language, there are many, many different ways in which you could say the same information in English. Now, 
this look good for a human, but even for a human or a machine, to go from that big uh, table of lots and lots of answers to a good translation, turns out that's a very difficult task. Because what the computer in this world that needs to do, it needs to find a path through all these millions and millions of translations. Actually, we, we sat down and we computed for some short sentences the total number of translations, and there are something to the 10 to the 300 possible uh, translations. And just to imagine, to, to get a feeling for how, that, how large that number is, the number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 81. So there are more translations in, in this world that a sentence can have than the number of atoms in the universe. So the state of the art in 1999 was that translation speed in this framework was about one sentence per day. And after we worked on it for a while, by 2000, we managed to get it to about one sentence per second. And when we did that, we got together with Kevin, and we got together with another colleague of mine, a student of mine, William Wong, and we said, well, maybe now it's time to commercialize this technology. And uh, we created in 2002 Language Weaver, the first company in the world that commercialized statistical machine translation. And first, we brought to market statistical machine translation technology in uh, the fields of information assimilation, and then at some point the technology was good enough to also help humans translate better and faster. And at some point, other research labs figured out that this is a good idea, so in 2007, Google brought to market Google Translate for a handful of languages, and then Bing Translate, and then more uh, markets open. By 2010, we sold the technology to SDL, and today, the technology continues to evolve. eBay is getting into translation to do uh, translations across commercial uh, languages. Uh, and maybe you have recently heard that also Skype now is going to move to having Skype translate so you can have your conversations with other people uh, that speak very different languages. So in summary, we went from, let's say, 1998, a scientific field that had no publications in statistical translation to a very vibrant field where today maybe there are about 400 publications in the field. We went from a world where automatic translations maybe were produced in the volumes of about 10 million words per day to today where there are more than 100 billion words translated, translated by machines every single day. And um, the world has changed. So. I've shown you two examples of how within, let's say, 10, 15 years, you could go from something that looks completely impossible to be done by machines to the machines making a very big difference in the world and uh, the technology being used by hundreds of millions of users. So the question is, what next? What are the technology trends? What's the future, the theme of this uh, event as well? And I think that's a very important question because especially if you're interested in commercializing technology, it's important to recognize the trends. If you manage to create a trend, that's the best. Or if you manage to make yourself part of a trend, you have much bigger chance to succeed. There are lots and lots of mistakes that you make as an entrepreneur as you create companies and you bring product to markets. And I think that if you have and ecosystems of companies that try to do the same thing at the same time, you have the opportunity to learn much more, not only from your own mistakes, but also from the others' mistakes. So your chance of succeeding is significantly higher. So what are the technology trends of today? I think there are at least three trends that uh, I identified. So I think that, j just think a little bit of the state of affairs. So let's say in, in the medical field. Today we have knowledge that we as humans have produced. There are more than 23 million publications just on uh, medical topics. And we have thousands and thousands of databases that curated lots and lots of knowledge about how, for example, different molecules interact and so on and so forth. And we have millions and millions of partially understood molecular interactions and systems. But still, we don't know how to cure cancer. So the, the human brain simply is not sufficiently powerful, if you want, 
to be able to patch together all this knowledge that is encoded in very different systems and um, uh, do something useful with it. By the same token, we have, let's say, on the web more than 100 billion web pages, billions of databases. We have tens of millions of partially understood bits of knowledge, but we have only rudimentary series, Cortana's, Google Now systems that we interact with, and they are absolutely pathetic today. So I think that we will see lots of technology that little by little is going to overcome the limits of human brains, bringing all these bits and pieces together. And over the, last 15, over the next 15 years, we're going to see lots of uh, innovation happening in this area. If you think of what you're doing on a daily basis, you're already leaving lots of crumbs behind you. And uh, you are experiencing the result of those crumbs. So whenever you go to Facebook, whenever you go to, to Google, the information that you get back, the ads that you see there, they are very different from one person to the other. And I think this is only the beginning. This, this personalization uh, that we see in the digital world today is just the beginning. Um, 100 years ago, Ford created a fortune and an industry by essentially saying, this is the car that the American people want, Model T and then driving the cost down and making everyone able to buy such a car. I believe that the successful companies of the future are going to do exactly the opposite. They are going to personalize everything. The food that you get is going to be personalized. Your medical, your medical care is going to be personalized. Your, your, every single aspect of your life is going to be personalized. I think the third fascinating trend is happening in the area of human machine computation. Today we are for the first time in the history of humankind where any entrepreneur has access to unlimited machine power and unlimited human power via the mechanical Turk. So you can go there and you can hire uh, lots of people of different skills and they can do human cognitive tasks for you. You just need to specify them and you can do that for very low costs. And I think at the intersection between humans on, and machines, we're going to see lots of innovation. It's already happening. In some instances, like Uber, who are, who's now disrupting, let's say, the whole transportation industry, taxi industry, machines play a tiny role. And the humans there are actually the drivers and the users, the people like me, who now, whenever I need a cab drive, I just click on my phone on a button. I say, I need a U Uber car and I get it instantaneously, and it's another person who happens to drive that car in that area who comes to uh, meet my need. In other areas, so for example, a colleague of mine at the University of Washington has built a program that enables machines and people figure out jointly as a team the 3D structure of a protein, in this case a retrovirus. A retrovirus that nobody could figure out the 3D structure for years and years, neither humans working in labs, neither machines working separately on simulation mode. But bringing humans and machines together, the power of machines and the power of the human brain, they were able to discover the structure of this, the 3D structure of, of this uh, retrovirus. So I think lots of innovation will happen in this area. So I think that magic is all around us. And uh, I think that the only important thing for us as humans is to keep our eyes open, recognize it, and then maybe be sufficiently audacious to have the courage to figure out how we want to change the world so that magic goes away and then being persistent enough to make it happen. Thank you very much.